broke away off. Castletown boys don't stop. Oh. Fucking what a bitchy boy. Damn it's a fucking deadly podcast, man. Kill. RTE. Pesh Kenny. Suburbs. Twitter. Oh, you know, hey. It's me again. It's a bit like the song by the fat bald lad from 2002 soft rock band Stained. It's been a while. Welcome to the Hardy Book, Chapter 7, with your main man, Eddie Durkin. Let's get straight into it, man. I hope you're enjoying reading this thus far. Oh. I originally started writing this on an iPad mini back in 2014. Procrastination. A lot of shit has taken place since then, man. I've eel made myself various edits so far and compiled them onto various different papers. Google. Like the 22A bus from Dublin to Ballina and getting there eventually. Longford Town. I'm doing this on my own steam, hey. And I'm a really sound boss. That's right. Maybe a little too sound. Oh, yeah. If I was the boss on The Apprentice, I would have fired myself first and I got on the piss with the contestants. Those city boys who go around in suits usually have class chonk. I'd wake up five days later and realize that most of them were dicks, oh, yeah. tapping me up for handy numbers and crucial information. Give them nothing. Lo and behold, this is why I'm not a CEO of a Fortune 500 company. Ambition. It's great if you know where you're going. But I barely have a clue which way the toilet is when I wake up in the middle of the night, needing to piss. Kicks. I'm seven chapters in, and I haven't gotten around to talking about my origin story. I will do now. So thanks for taking the time out to read it, or if you're listening to it, better again. I really do hope you're enjoying it. Oh, why wouldn't you? We can all do with a laugh these days. Big time. Everything is so litigious and boring, man. American cuts. I'll be getting into that too. Reading a book is time consuming enough, but writing one man, fuck me. The amount of self-discipline it takes is unreal man. Takes me ages to get into the zone and get started. When I'm off then, I'm like French Toast O'Toole after a breakout. No bastard will stop me. (laughs) Fucking sorry. To be fair though, literally any excuse and I'm gone for months. Gonzo. I personally couldn't be arsed reading many books myself, Shite. as it's fairly boring, sitting still for long periods of time, looking at words, too time consuming, and I'd rather be watching YouTube or playing PlayStation. Any good games lately? Gran Turismo 7's out. I don't know why I'm asking you that, it's not like you can answer me. Well, you can go on Eddie Durkin on Twitter, and who knows, maybe this book will become a considered vital inside look at the early 21st century Ireland. I support the current thing. It might well be part of the leaving cert. Never mind Beckett, Joyce and Yates. Morbid old bastards. They'll say, fair play to Durkin. Pub talkers. He knew well the crack. Oh yeah. Maybe in the future, students will ask Miss Robot, what's a Twitter? Softcocks. Twitter was a place online where softcocks complained about bollocks before the Great War. Spiteful bastards. Now buckle up. Gonna be a wild ride in this R34 GTR Skyline. Swoo! Prepare yourselves a nice cup of tea, laced with a touchy and a brandy. Grab a few jam bombs, pack it of Fox Viennese fingers, and get stuck into a great read. As the stamp said to the envelope, stick with me, us cunts are going places. Good one, Eddie. Here we go. I'll begin by talking about my work ethic, as most of life's folly revolves around this aspect of my personality. I blame most of my shortcomings on ADHD. Some folks think it's all pub talk. Professionals think it's the last resort against a boring society. Who am I to judge? Those who are non-privy to the intricacies of neurological psychological studies will consider ADHD as a highfalutin excuse for laziness, lack of discipline and poor self-control. I beg to differ. I really would. As would the shrink who did tests on my brain box. Hard work on myself. Never really got along. Paying someone else's mortgage. I like to go at life in bursts and chill out. Like the lion in the Serengeti. I like to chill and hop on any opportunity that will improve my standard of living. Aww. The problem is, 
I get fired all the time. I always have trouble with my fucking boss. They're always making me feel awkward. Bunch of jobs worthies. Always hovering around waiting for me to slip up. Trying to catch me Dawson or sleeping on the job. It's bad for him. So what's wrong with Dawson, man? They don't understand the concept that a happy worker is a good worker. And I'm happiest when I'm doing as little as possible. Like I say, I'll do a great amount of work in short bursts. What's the difference? If you can do four hours work in 45 minutes. Burst work. The same way you would in four hours. The job is done. You're only looking busy. Spuddling. That's all you're doing. Spuddlers, man. As dodgy as Google are, they at least realise the critical potential of letting lads play games and chill out between bouts of work. Free chocolate bar. So what? If I was working on an assembly line in a large multinational pharmaceutical factory making valves to widen the pulmonary arteries after open heart surgery. Medtronic. A man has to work at his own pace, right? Oh yeah. Bastards. They fired me for eating crisps and handling platinum components with me bare hands. Corn snacks. Some lanky English clown called Stu ratted me out to admin for getting, <laughs> for getting monster munch crumbs on the merch. They tried to blame a load of people dying on me in the States. Fatties. I said, you know what you can do? What? Shove your job up your hole, bunch of fucking pussies. If I ever get a hold of that sweaty, palmed, bald and vulture-necked English prick, I'll do at least two weeks from in Castlery Prison. Thug mansion. If I get a hold of him at all, Check his hair I'll get him down on the ground and just apply fierce pressure to him. Pressure. Grind the shoulder deep under his jaw from side mount. Pin him, then grind him down with a flurry of clock butts. Oh. Dance a jig on him then, shouting, You do nothing to me, man! Down his greasy, blackhead festered lug hole. Give it to him proper. That's life, man. I've always been given the short end of the stick from bosses, ever since I can remember. Have you, though? Lay it again, Durkin. Where's your tools? How many more days are you going to take off? I don't care if you're hungover. Kids are sick. You don't even have kids. I've been fired for more jobs than literally anyone else I know of. I eventually came to the conclusion that I'm better off being my own boss. You're right. That's why I've attempted so many startup projects over the years. Startups. Each project I started off began on good terms. Then things started unraveling. I started showing resentment even towards myself. I'd say to myself in the morning, Come on now, Eddie. Get up out the bed and seize the day. Get up now. This is the start of a wonderful journey. Come on. Ah, shut up, you dickhead. The bed's your natural habitat. Why would you be wanting to get up? It's all lies, man. It's only half eleven in the morning. That said, I'd still consider myself an entrepreneur. Being my own boss. Self-employed. Yet, I'm my own worst critic. Fired myself at least four times. But hey, I'm still on the learning curve. You're either winning or you're learning. Right? Don't know, man. I'd usually start a project with great passion and gusto. Often, after a day's work, I realise how massive the scale of the project is. Then... The voice of self-doubt creeps in. So I'll sit in front of the laptop, find an inspiration for the next venture. But then, I'll go onto Facebook and have a mooch, Mm. looking at pictures of lads down in Australia, glaciers in New Zealand, and I think to myself, I should have gone. Should have stayed in New York when I had the chance. Fuck the visa. My cousin Kevin has a big farm in Montana. Big ball. He can't come home. Ever. But you look at He's driving around in a pimped out Ford 150 pickup truck. Ford Raptor job. Ooh, quad bikes. Most days lead to me being pissed off at more successful pricks, gloating about how great their life is. Wankers. Smug lads posting holiday snaps from the other side of the world. Oh. Then I'll check Instagram, only to find other lads showing off class six packs. Class bodies. Fully glossed media big shots like Callum Best coining it in Barry Bonko as well as those hard working academic lads who used to take the piss out of in school who are now working as chartered accountants and barristers KPMG what could have been women I could have married by now Brussels I often wonder why I even bothered to become a part of Zuckerberg's matrix of psychological profiling in the first place Facebook it seemed like a good idea back in 2007 when I too enjoyed gloating about what a cool prick I was 
for every idiot got onto it. The old lady's on it now. I don't even bother putting up anything on my wall anymore. Anything I post up offends somebody somewhere. The modern world is full of easily offended softies. Now my Facebook wall resembles an episode of the Jerry Springer show. It ruined the crack. I once shared a post from the Sunday Sport saying two criminals were bummed for burglary. Bummed. Sunday Sport had used mugshots of two presumably convicted paedophiles in America. Nonsense. Claiming they were two bob thieves caught in the act by a big hairy ex-con gay man. Smoking a cigar while sitting in a pair of white boxers. Or tidy whiteies, as they call them in the States. Big hairy chest on them. Must have been about 6'9". Tyson Fury job. The crux of the mock story being the thieves were apprehended by the man known as the Wolf. The Wolf. Held against their will and sodomized. Bummed senseless. Until law enforcement arrived. The threads broke off into trellises that lasted for days. I won't go any further on those details. Though I did think the article was funny in fairness. People were sad about it. For any of you broadsheet merchants out there, not privy to Sunday or weekly sport, it's like the Sun newspaper, only only more highbrow. There's boobs in football. Like Nuts magazine, or to a lesser extent, Zoo. Way Pabamo. Like budget one-page article versions of FHM. Buzz McDonald used to buy it every week. He once had a poster of a chimp who could do karate. He was dressed up in a white kimono and a black belt. He was throwing slaps at his owner, an Asian lad with a skullet who looked like a cross between the oozy-toting Korean henchman from Die Hard 1 and Terry Nookins from the really wild show on Children's BBC. It was class, man. Chris Packham. Buzz said, he'd take the chimp in a fight. Despite me explaining primates had explosive strength. Jackie Chimp. Taking it further, showing him pictures of people unfortunate enough to wrong one. This only strengthened his resolve. I had to send him out to the shed, punch the bag for an hour, just to calm down. We went for spinning the car afterwards. Bought a 99 flake chocolate garnished ice cream cone and watched the sunset over the Atlantic. As we gazed over Clue Bay, enjoying our cones, he stoically said, I swear down on my mum's life, I'd fucking smash that chimp to death in 12 seconds. I decided to take the path of least resistance and agreed with him. It wasn't enough. For the sake of keeping the peace, I had to apologise for doubting him in the first place. That's Buzz McDonald though. He's terminally ignorant. But any man willing to go toe-to-toe with a fully grown chimp versed in martial arts is the right man to have in your corner. Jackie Chimp. My workday continued. After all this online self-flagellation, I read some emails, usually junk mail, sent out from various department stores. But get this though, I may well be on to a winner. Oh, I recently received an email from a lad in Nigeria yeah? claiming to be a lawyer working on behalf of some rich prince who died. Easy money. The daft prick has bequeathed me a large sum of money from his estate. Take the money. All he needs in return is my bank details. He said he wants to meet me in Galway to discuss my fortune. He says I'll have to pay for a few nominal legal fees. Oh. It sounds too good to be true, so I'll have to discuss this with my business partner. Donatello, Donatello Bugenhagen, Bugenhagen, as he's a whiz with all these legal matters. How can I go wrong though? I'll at least meet up with him and see what he says, and he can get the pints in. Lovely pints. After checking my emails, I'll go surfing the net for a while, illegally downloading class tunes from Eminem and the Bloodhound Gang, thus taking me back to the early noughties in a nostalgic voyage. I saw hunt. Even this innocuous activity gives way to feelings of melancholia, Pondering my mortality and the ever quicker passing of time. What's it all about, man? That next year marks 20 years since I did my leaving cert. Actually, that's been updated to 22 years now. And I will have been an active adult in Irish society for that long. Oh, God. That's depressing. Fucking boring. I have to take a few moments. I'm back. Sorry about that. I saw an advertisement for Russian singles in my area, which led me on to having to to rub one out. It temporarily allowed me to escape the impending sense of failure and self-dissatisfaction. 
But after the beans were discharged, I felt even worse. The internet is ruining my life. The cheese gone. I'll have to call up to the lads when we go spinning around town. Maybe grab a chicken wrap from Cora Boyle's deli. And I put the work off until tomorrow. Dead right. Back again. I just had a surprise visit from the Department of Social Welfare. They sent out evil means test supervisor, Eamon Loftus. He calls out to people's houses, checking to see if you're a legitimate job seeker. And that, in fact, you are in need of the much coveted weekly 186 euro bounty. Lovely money. Like the witch finder general, he knows that his arbitrary word is final. He enters into your home with an air of supremacy, talking to us like we're layabout dossers. But we have dreams. I dream of being a Formula One driver. I can still get there. Nothing is impossible. Try telling that to him and Loftus. It's a lost cause. When Loftus comes darkening the door, one must be prepared to surrender the cavalier, workshy ego by adopting the respectful persona of a hard-working pillar of the community that's fallen upon hard times. For Loftus, the all-knowing Dole Inspector wields the power to sever your precious financial lifeline. At any moment, with the stroke of a pen, the good times can come to an end in an instant. Good luck finding a decent job around Castletown. Last time I was cut off my benefits. I was cleaning arses for six months. Lucky enough, I was fired and went back on the scratch. The Dole won't grant benefactors the purchasing power to obtain a luxury villa in Val de Lobo, in the Algarve, Portugal. But it's worth noting, the Dole will more than likely damage your economic libido, drip feeding you enough of a basic income so you can sleep in till noon to live a generally stress-free lifestyle. Can't take it with you. You'll have to forego lofty ambitions of stock markets and property portfolios, but the question is, who's enjoying life most? The Wall Street trader, wound up, stressed to the gills with colitis and irritable bowel syndrome. Or Mikey Salmon, a man who lives a whimsical, happy-go-lucky lifestyle, ambling down country lanes on summer's evenings. He can often be seen in his natural habitat, the pub, supping fruity pints of red ale, watching midweek Champions League matches, content as a lord, chatting with friends, basking in the glowing comfort of the fireside on a winter's evening. Life on the dole forces you to be frugal, teaching individuals the importance of an immaterial lifestyle. In a nutshell, being on the dole is akin to being Buddhist. It's a simple circle of life and gratitude, leaving job seekers, students, enough time to ponder greater world issues, decluttering the mind, giving time to pursue your dreams. Many folks use the generosity of the dole as a springboard, vaulting into higher states of learning. Then there are those who have absolutely no intention of elevating themselves out of the welfare sphere, choosing instead to eat McCain oven chips while watching Jeremy Kyle and X Factor. That's their choice. Let them off. They cause infinitely less harm than those big shop banking bastards that have caused the recession. Everyone kisses their arse because they wear pinstripe suits and go to weird eyes wide shut masquerade balls. Bunch of fucking scummers, man. In fairness to my doll officer, Bobby Gumble, he always looks after me, God bless him. He was the one of the soundest men alive. A bit cranky at times, but he'd always help you out with the paperwork. He grunt at you for documentation and other info. You had to be quick with him. He was busy. Sure half the town was in at him. Don't try and bullshit him either. He knew all the excuses in the book. Just level with them. Tell them you just want to chill out, not wanting to work in a dead-end job, paying off someone else's mortgage. He'll respect that. He never got up on his high horse to pontificate. He kept this town going. I for one think he should have had a house in the state named after him, such as Gumblebrook Drive or Gumbleton Heights. If you ever had a cash and hand job on the sly, he'd always turn a blind eye, providing you'd slip him a touch into the claw. Make hay while the sun shines, he'd often say. As long as I get a touch, you're a golden sunsets. Patrons would often slide over a drop of Powers whiskey or a frozen turkey Christmas time. The odd cheeky tenor is goodwill. I fucking love that man. Half the town would have caught the bullet from him, and that's gospel. Rest in peace, Bobby G. 
I got nothing but love for you, baby boy. And that's word. It's good to talk. I wish my previous employers had shown the same sympathy that Bobby bestowed upon me. I swear to God, man. All they ever did was give out to me. It's not fair. Constantly being disciplined for talking on the job. Sure, it's good to talk. In fairness, Bob Hoskins used to say that. God rest him too. Just look where that phrase got him. He'll always be remembered for saying it was good to talk. He was also the only living man to motorboat Jessica Rabbit. Remember her? She was that sexy looking cartoon woman from that movie. Cool World. <laughs> she had class tits. <laughs> and a lovely body. A man... Imagine getting a Cuban wife. <laughs> Imagine getting a Cuban wank off her, man. <laughs> Fuck me. I can say this because she's not a real woman, but a collection of stills. On a side note, I doubt this will be held in high esteem by small-handed softies working in Ireland's legacy media. There are too many who would consider the above themes of hypothetical lovemaking to a fictional character as promoting misogynistic overtones. Be that as it may, I think women are class, man. Sure, my mum is one. For single men out there in the dating game, and you're on Tinder, women don't want to see penis selfies. Hard or soft. Sure, if they wanted to see that man, they could just Google erect penis and click on images. Sure, there's no end of flutes to ogle. You know who you are. Keep it in the pants. Glad. Hold your mind. Generally speaking, people today are more offended by anything. My mother back in Castletown calls these people soft shites or pussies. Men and women that never had to chase the crow for food. Usually middle class white folks, fond of Twitter, Tumblr and other daft platforms that offers unhinged people a public platform. To grandstand. The Guardian. I've seen thicker skins on boiled milk. The loudest voices are often American college educated millennials saddled in cruel amounts of debt from prestigious Ivy League universities, industrializing rehashed talking points provided to them by tenured, tweed laden, bespectacled spoofers. I tell you this I dodged a bullet not going to college. I wouldn't mind it was a false course. Studying how to make metal tools on a CNC lathe. Instead, I formed my social discourse through years of flicking through pages of literary titans such as FHM or Zoo Magazine, and a lifetime of living in a hard town full of tough nuts where the law of the jungle still applies. A community of inhabitants speaking freely with refreshing ignorance, dishing out hammerings to those who dare to harshly contest their worldview, and rightly so. There's no safety like anonymously sniping from the shadows of the internet, or hiding comfortably behind the protection of the legal system. There are local lads who love to talk with the fist. They drove tractors to school. Now they spin around the town, driving hatchbacks and wearing jackets that say Honda, the power of dreams. Like I wrote before, their mantra is if in doubt, diff it out. That said, it's one thing to be handy with the dukes in the streets, but it's another matter entirely when you're surrounded by posh lads in fancy suits. I'm talking about the court of law, where the pen is indeed mightier than the sword. Rich folks draped in cloaks and wigs made out of rope, talking lofty jargon that can bemuse even the hardiest of hard lads. Times like these, you have to be handy with the chat, and by the chat, I mean, shut your gob, let the barrister do the talking. But I digress. Now, as you may have noticed, I'm an awful man for going off on tangents, and you're well versed at this stage of the book, and I'm deadly serious. My stream of consciousness knows no limits. So stick with me, and I'll eventually wrap everything up into a neat little package. Will you though? If not, I'll pay some sound editor to tie up any loose ends. Uh. My stream of consciousness is how I manage to botch up 
my English exam for the leave insert. The leave insert being a pivotal point in my life where I couldn't give a fuck about further education. And boy, have I paid for it since. The marks. Don't know how I managed to get all the way through school and into the leave insert exam. It was against all odds. And by Christ, I wasn't going to put myself through another seven years of that crack. I had virtually no ambition nor encouragement to become a doctor, Dr. Doolittle, an architect, or even a kitchen porter. I have to add to that, I was also fairly poor growing up. The virtue of further education was rarely at the cutting edge of my parents' modus operandi. I always thought I was a bit thick, until I realised that many wealthy kids I went to school with, some of them genuinely thicker than a McFlurry, availed of extracurricular education in the form of grinds. They were sent to Yates College in Galway to get handy educational life hacks to complete the leaving cert. In other words, if you had the money, you had the resources. Again, I'm digressing, for fuck's sake, sorry. I'm some man for the digression. Digression! And that's a new word I picked up from watching YouTube videos. The Try Channel. During my leaving cert higher educational exam, which I took for the crack, I was asked to write an essay about a book called Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Apparently, they were two Jewish lads who hung out with a Danish prince who invented cigars or some shit. Rada. The play took place in the olden days, in ancient Denmark. It was a time when lads walked around with swords and shit. Scabbards. They all hung out in a spooky castle. An actual ghost lived there. Ooh. Turns out the ghost was Hamlet's owl lad. He'd gotten dodged in by his brother. Claudius, oh. Hamlet's uncle. Sneaky son of a bitch ended up running off with Hamlet's ma. Claudius had enough cheek for a new arse. So in essence, I had absolutely no idea what went on in the official story, but I, <laughs> but I guessed that the two boys had been sent off and killed to death by some local bad bastards. With this total lack of crucial information, I decided to use some artistic licensing and put my blue steadler biro to the test sheet. I made up my own story, as follows. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern versus Paul Pot, leaving cert higher exam by Eddie Durkin. Once upon a time, there lived Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, two tough, c <laughs> two tough cunts in the American army sent on a mission of mercy to Vietnam. They were sent into the jungles of Manila to fight against the doctor Paul Pot's Communist Nazis. Pot was an evil dictator. He killed anybody who smoked it up with Sweet Mary Jane. All hell broke loose when Rosencrantz and the boys landed in their Apache gunship and started fucking shit up. Rosencrantz opened up a volley of rounds from his minigun. The North Vietnamese bad boys started fighting at him. AKs and bazookas blazing in the hot jungle moonlight. Red tracer bullets streaking through the night sky. Fuck this shit, man, cried Rosencrantz. I hear you, player, returned Guildenstern. All of a sudden, the Vietnamese Nazis started legging it bad style. R and G, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, were now being chased by the Predator. G-Man pulled out his Uzi and shouted, Fuck off! And shot the Predator into the arm. Green blood splooshed all over the gaff. Then Predator got really mad. The chase went on through the jungle for nine solid days. Till Predator said, Fuck this lads, I'm wrecked. I guess we should just put our differences aside. Fur balls to you both. You have great cardiovascular fitness. Cheers, says Rodenkrantz. We're class on steroids. We have to be careful though. If we take too many, our willies can shrink and we can get a heart attack. Do you fancy going for a few scoops? Predator agreed that all of this running around the jungle had indeed made him work up a thirst. So they all went down the pub. After a few Lushners, they all got on really well and decided they should liberate the, liberate the Vietnamese people from Pol Pot and let them smoke as much weed as they liked. So they all called round to Pol Pot's lair later that night, pissed as newts. Time to fuck him up. The two lads and Predator waited outside Pot's complex. Predator gave them a cloaking device so they could slip past Pol Pot's henchmen. They stealthily snuck into Pol Pot's chamber. The jig is up, Pol Pot. 
if that in fact is your real name, cried Gildenstern. Ha ha, I have your fools right where I want you. Now it is time to die. Pol Pot wasn't actually a man, but a fucking Terminator robot. Blam, blam, blam. Predator's head was blown right off his fucking shoulders. A fucking creep! Aaron G opened up the M60 and started blasting away. Paul Pot started firing lasers out of his wrists. The two boys were like, fuck this crack, it's not worth it. So they jumped into an Apache under a hail of really bad bullets and shit. Thanks to the advanced firepower of the top secret Apache prototype, they blew the shite out of Pol Pot's gaff. The explosions were massive. Aaron G high-fived, USA! Suddenly, Pol Pot walks out of the flames, skin all melted off, just a cybernetic endoskeleton at this stage. Rosencrantz locked onto him with a Hellfire missile as Gildenstern fired the minigun. Boom! What a ta 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 Pol Pot was a goner. The Vietnamese people celebrated with really nice hydro and mellow Thai stick. Suddenly, loads of sexy Asian babes were going around saying, Me so horny, me love you long time. So Aaron G stayed and partied for seven moons. They had a great time of it, but they knew they had work to do in the Russian desert. So after that, they set off for the good old US of stateside. They should have returned to a hero's welcome, but unfortunately, they crashed into the sea after doing 15 bongs and a bottle of Jack Daniels whiskey over the Pacific. It wasn't the drink or weed that made them crash the chopper. They ran out of fuel and got eaten by a great white and or mako shark. The fight went on for days, but the lads ran out of water and died of thirst as they were fighting the sharks. The memory will always live on in the hearts and minds of the Viet Congo veterans. The end. In conclusion, well, I for one was really impressed with myself at that time. A job well done, I said to myself, as I coolly walked down the hall listening to my Nirvana Nevermind tape in my Walkman. I celebrated outside the gym hall afterwards, enjoying a lovely Benson fag. I felt that the written exam went far better than my foundation maths test. And that was a cinch. All we had to do was colour in a few boxes and draw a few sums. Piss easy. When August finally arrived, I had eagerly awaited to hear the, what the examiner had to say. He certainly didn't share the same sentiments as I had, citing, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are characters from William Shakespeare's Hamlet. It is a common mistake for higher level English students to misinterpret the characters from Hamlet. With the Tom Stoppard's tragic comedy, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. They said that my paper was one of the most bizarre reports on a topic they've ever read, which surely can only be a good thing, right? They could have at least given me an E, but instead gave me a D3 for creativity. Proper order. Did you like that? No, did you? Did you like it? No lie. You're fucked! Come here to me, if you liked it. Do me a favour, man. Support the Dirk Meister General and go over to Hardy Books Patreon. Oh, sure having the podcast. Those GoDaddy bastards charge me 150 quid just to have a website that says hardybookspodcast.com. And I tell you something, never did I put anything up on that fucking website. Fucking GoDaddy. Oh, then epidemic sounds, hey. Those bastards are charging me twelve fifty a month. Bastards. Then fucking Spreaker, man. Oh, 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 oh. They're charging me seven quid a month too. So, I mean, it's costing me money to fucking do this. But come here, listen. Even if it's fucking 200 quid a month, man. Every little helps, you know what I mean? Fucking Tesco job. But come here, listen, spread the word on this, hey, and get your friends listen to it, because they need it, man. They fucking need it, man. But come here, good luck and good bless. I love you all, and I hope you really have enjoyed listening to this. The next part will be out soon. 
Chuck your lure. Good luck and good